Allah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'na wa anfa'na bima alamtana Alhamdulillah we're continuing with this new course that we've started which is going through the book written by the Shaykh Sa'id al-Kahtani rahimahullah may Allah have mercy upon his soul Hisn uh, al-Muslim Hisn al-Muslim Hisn al-Muslim the fortress uh, of the Muslim uh, different du'as and remembrances that we're supposed to say throughout the day in different times and places. So after last week's introductions, which was a general introduction pertaining to dhikr and its virtues, the virtues of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how highly they are rewarded and how beneficial that is for us as servants of Allah. Today we're going to take our first remembrance and it comes under the section which is adhkar al-istayqad min al -nawm. The adhkar, the remembrances that you say upon waking up from sleep. So the remembrance is, Alhamdulillah, alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who gave us life after having caused us to die, and to him is the return. So the first thing we're going to look at is where was this remembrance taken from, which hadith? So the first thing is, laftul hadith, the wording of the hadith. And Hudayfa ibn Yaman, and Hudayfa ibn Yaman, radiyallahu anhu, from Hudayfa ibn Yaman, the companion, radiyallahu anhu, قال, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أوى إلى فراشه قال, that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, when he used to go to his bed, when he would lay upon his bed, he would say, بسمك أموت وأحيا, in your name, Allah subhanahu wa taala, I die and I'm living. With your name, I die and I live. Qama, and this is the point that we're taking. And when he got up from his bed, he got up, he would say, Alhamdulillahi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who has given us life after giving us death, and to him is going to be the return. Wahada laftul Bukhari, and this is the wording of Imam al Bukhari. So now what we're going to do, we're going to look at the words one by one and try to understand them and take benefits from them inshallah the first of the wordings is alhamdulillah praise be to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it's normally translated so how do the scholars mention what alhamdulillah means they say wasful mahmud bi sifat al kamal they say it's to describe the one who is being described meaning allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe the one who is being praised with complete attributes of complete perfection describing Allah Azawajal with attributes of complete perfection. Ma'al mahabba wa ta'adheem. Along with loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and giving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the great and mighty status that he deserves. So wasful mahmud. When you say alhamdulillah, its meaning is that you are praising the one who is to be praised, who is Allah, bisifat al kamal, with all types of attributes that are completely perfect, they have no deficiencies in them whatsoever. Ma'al mahabba, along with loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in short, loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means that you submit to Him willingly, happily. And whenever it comes to the point that there is a halal and a haram choice in front of you, you will always choose the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over the love of the thing which is causing you to do the haram. So it could be a situation where you have uh, a husband or a wife is asking you to do something haram for them and you truly love that person but then you remember the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supposed to be greater so you choose the love of Allah as wajal ma'al mahabba wa ta'zeem and then magnifying Allah giving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the status in your heart in your mind in your life that he deserves the status of greatness and the state of being the most mighty so this is the meaning of alhamdulillah wasful mahmud bi sifat al kamal ma'al mahabba wa ta'zeem Describing the one who is being praised with complete, uh, describing with attributes of complete perfection, with love and glorification of his magnification. So after Alhamdulillah, the word is Alladhi Ahyana, the one that has given us life. Ay qaddaralana and astaykhid ba'd al mawtati sughra wa hiya nawm. The one that has given us life again after giving us the small death which is sleep so sleep is considered as a small death as we'll come to explain a bit more so we say praise be to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has once again given us life after he gave us this small death 
Shaykh Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala in his explanation of this particular hadith in Riyad al-Salihin, he said, when you wake up from your sleep, you remember that as you have been raised now from your minor death, you're one day going to be raised from your major death, meaning the actual death which takes you from this world and cuts you off from this world forever. So when you remember that you're going to be raised from your major death out of your grave, and that you're going to be brought in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for resurrection and for judgment, this then increases you in iman and faith. So when you say, Alhamdulillahilladhi ahyana, praise be to Allah who has given me life once again, you're going to remember in your mind and in your heart that he's given me life now, but there's going to be a time when there's going to be no more life for me. I'm not going to get up again. There's not going to be another opportunity for me. So the Shaykh is saying, Uthaymin rahimullah, that the more you have this belief in your heart, the belief of resurrection, and that there's going to come a time when you're not going to be raised, when you're not going to be given another day in this world, then that would cause you to work more in doing righteous deeds. Because the one who doesn't believe in this resurrection, and meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this person doesn't have faith which is going to propel them to do righteous deeds. But the more you believe in this and the more you think about it, then the more you'll be propelled and the more you'll be pushed forward to do righteous deeds because you will understand the urgency of the need to do righteous deeds because time is short and you don't know if you're going to get another day in this world and you will rush to do whatever pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you safety in the hereafter. And then the next word is ba'dama amatina. So alhamdulillah alladhi ahyana. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has given us life. Ba'dama amatina. After he had given us death. Sumiya al-nawm mawtan li ishtiraqi ma fi inqita'a ta'alluq al-ruh bil badan. That sleep is given the title of death. Why? Because it shares with death the fact that the soul is now departed from the body. Because when you go to sleep, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-An'am, وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that takes your soul in the night. So when you are asleep, your soul leaves your body, like it does when you are dead. And Imam Ibn Kathir, one of the scholars of the tafsir explaining the Quran, who is very famous, he said pertaining, this, uh, pertaining to this verse, he is the one that takes your soul at night. He mentioned a hadith, and I'm not sure if it's authentic or not, but this great imam, he mentions it in his explanation of the Quran anyway. He said that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that there are angels that are responsible for taking your soul every night. They take your soul, that's their responsibility, and they return your soul to you. However, there is a time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands those angels not to return the soul to you. So this situation lets us know that sleep is like a minor death as when we die the major death the soul will leave the body not return in the minor death which is the sleep the soul leaves the body but it does return until the time comes when Allah gives it the command not to return so that is the meaning that we think of so in the narration we have Allahumma Allahumma this word is a very important word for us to understand because it's a replacement, according to the majority of the Arabic uh, language scholars, like Sibuwe and others, it's a replacement of the word saying, Ya Allah. So when you say Allahumma, instead of saying, Ya Allah, calling upon Allah in that way, you say Allahumma, right? And so this meme is Iwadun of Ya. It's a replacement of the Ya. So Meme al-Mushaddada is Iwadun min Ya. It's a replacement of the Ya. And Imam ibn Qayyim, he has a very interesting explanation, the summary of which is, that when you say Allahumma, the meme here, it means plurality, okay? It means plural. For example, when you say anta in Arabic, that means you, one person. To make it plural, you will say antum. You change anta to antum using a meme, okay? When you say huwa, he, and you make it plural, you say hum. So the meme is used for plural. So it's as though you are calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all his beautiful names and attributes because of that meme, okay? It's, it's plural, it's, it's plural. Allahumma. In the hadith, it was mentioned that we're explaining, Bismika amutu wa ahya. In your name, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I die and I'm given leth, uh, life. So as though, Bismika al muhyi ahya. As though you are saying, oh Allah, in your name, al muhyi al muhyi is one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names, which means the one who gives life. So with your name, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm giving you life. 
وَبِسْمِكَ الْمُمِيتُ أَمُوتُ And with your name, Al-Mumit, I am given death. As mentioned in Fatah al-Bari by Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani. Some of the points which are to be taken as benefit from this hadith is the hirs al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala dhikri allahi subhanahu wa ta'ala fi jami'i ahwalihi hatta in the nawm wal yaqadhati. That this shows us how eager the Prophet ﷺ was to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all situations, even when he's going to sleep and even when he's getting up. And this is because Aisha radiallahu anha, she says in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يذكر الله في كل أحيانه that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times, whether he is going to bed, whether he's getting up from his bed, in all situations and in all times. And also we benefit from the, from the dua that we are learning in the hadith, استسلام النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لرب العالمين وأنه سبحان الذي بيده كل شيء الحياة والموت وغير ذلك ولهذا قال باسمك أموت وأحيا That the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم while saying this dhikr he is submitting himself to the decree and the power of Allah سبحانه وتعالى because he is declaring that Allah سبحانه وتعالى is the one who controls everything he controls life and he controls death and everything other than that that's why he said باسمك أموت وأحيا in your name I am given life, I am given death, and I am given life. We take from the hadith also, that sleep is from the greatest of indications of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mercy to his servants. It's from the greatest of indications of Allah's mercy to his servants. Because Allah says in the Quran, وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ subata." We have made your sleep for you a stillness. We have made your sleep for you a time for you to be still. And your body not to exert energy. A time for you to recover. So this is a great sign of Allah's kindness to us. Because throughout the day we get tired. And if it wasn't for this sleep, we wouldn't be able to recover to again function the next day. Or to get up and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And think about how many people in the world are trialed with the difficulty of not being able to get a good night's sleep. If you don't get a good night's sleep, your mind doesn't function properly. You're hazy and dizzy. You're unable to concentrate the way you want to. You're unable to have the energy that you want to have. So, so many people are trialed with this issue of not being able to sleep properly. In fact, taking sleeping pills is something which is widely spread amongst so many people. So, this is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relating to his vast mercy upon the slaves that he enables them to sleep and there are some people sadly that take this in the wrong way they sleep too much instead of just taking what they need the eight hours or that which is less than that they take more than that and they spend most of their life sleeping which is something which is absolutely wrong we benefit also from the hadith that this hajat al-khalq illa al-nawm alladhi huwa sifatun naqs dalilun al-istihqaq ifrad Allah bil-ibadah fa huwa hayyun la yamut qayyumun la yanam that this description of the need of the human being to want to sleep to having the need to sleep it's a proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone is the one that should be worshipped and none of the creation should be worshipped right because all of the creation they need to rest and they need to sleep but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hayy la yamut he is the one that is truly living and he never dies. He is Qayyum la yanam. Qayyum meaning the one that has absolutely no need from his creation and all of his creation need him. So he doesn't sleep. So when we reflect upon this, then you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that deserves to be worshipped in truth. Al-istayqad ba'da nawm burhanun ala qudratillah ala al-ihya ba'da al-mawt wal-fana. The fact that we wake up after sleep is a proof for the ability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's able to give life after death. Because if he can bring us back in an instant after we have slept and our souls have left our body, then he can bring us back in an instant also after death from our graves for us to be judged. It's of, no, it's of nothing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also we take الْأَرْوَاحُ بِيَدِ اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُمْ فَإِن شَاءَ أَمْسَكَهَا وَإِن شَاءَ أَرْسَلَهَا فَلَوْ الْحِكْمَةُ الْبَالِغَةُ We also take and we understand that the souls, they are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. There is none other that controls the soul apart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah azza wa jal wishes to withhold the soul and not to give it life, then he may do so. And if he wishes to let it go forward and give it life, then he does so. And he has a wisdom in doing whether he withholds or whether he lets the soul go forth. There is a great wisdom in that. A person should deeply reflect all the time 
when they say these type of du'as pertaining to going to sleep and getting back up. Before I go to sleep, I have to ensure that I make a sincere tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have to make a sincere repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because as we've just learned, our sleep is a minor death and our souls are taken from us. And it's not guaranteed that our souls are going to return to us. So if that's the case, how can we go to sleep after having just committed a sin? Maybe we watched a particular thing that we should not have watched. Maybe we spoke or behaved in a manner that we should not have spoken in. None of us is guaranteed that after we go to sleep that we're going to get up. So we have to ensure that when we go to sleep, we make tawbah. We go to sleep only after having begged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. That can be through dua, that can be through praying some extra, extra units of prayer. And then if you are given extra life in the sense that you are given another day to live, that for you should be a time to be full of gratitude, full of joy, full of positive energy. Not a day when you waste your energy and your time doing things which don't benefit you. Rather, you should use that extra day that you have in your life to live it to the best of your ability, make yourself happy, make those around you happy, and ensure that you fill it with lots of worship so that you can benefit from that day in the hereafter. So that's what we took from that dua. Alhamdulillah, alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave us life after he had caused us to die and to him will be the return. Bismillah, the second dua that we're going to take and remember as I said before that these duas, if you find it difficult to learn, it doesn't matter because there's going to be a time when you will come to learn them, when you have the ability to memorize them and learn them. At least you have gone through the explanation, you understand the meanings of them. So when you do learn them and you implement them, them in your lives, you have some thoughts that you can refer back to these du'as and dhikrs. The second du'a is uh, narrated by Ibn Majah, the hadith scholar Ibn Majah, from the companion Ubada Ibn Samit radiallahu anhu, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi min al-layl, the Prophet sallallahu said, whoever gets up in the night, man ta'ara min al-layl, faqal hina yastayqid. And he says when he gets up, this person, he or she, la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu. There is none to be worshipped in truth except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he has no partner. Lahu al-mulk, to him belongs everything in creation. Walahu al-hamd, walahu al-hamd. And to him belongs all praise. And he is able over and he is with all things able. Subhanallah, glory be to Allah, walhamdulillah, praise be to Allah, wala ilaha illallah, and there is none to be worshipped in truth except Allah, wallahu akbar, and Allah is the greatest. I'm going to leave this phrase for a bit later so we can explain it in detail. So the person, when he gets up in the night and he says this dua, and then he makes a dua, if he says, oh my Lord, forgive me, then he is forgiven for all his sins. Qal al-Walid, one of the narrators of the hadith, he said, or the Prophet said, and if the person makes a dua after saying, oh Allah, forgive me, then his dua, his supplication is going to be answered. And then after all of that, if the person gets up, making wudu and he prays in the night, then his prayer is going to be guaranteed, accepted from him. So the first statement in this amazing dhikr that somebody should say when they get up in the night, whether they get up to pray or they don't get up to pray, is that they should say, La ilaha illallah which means la ma'bud bi haq illa Allah that there is none to be worshipped in truth other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala la ilaha illa Allah there is none to be worshipped in truth other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there are many false gods besides Allah but the only one to be worshipped in truth and justice is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the reason for the creation to have been created wama khalaqtu al-jinna wal insa illa liya'budun Allah didn't create the jinn and human beings and all other creation except so that they could recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his oneness and worship him alone. This word, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, is the key to paradise. The one who learns it, internalizes its meanings, and lives by what it dictates, this person will enter into paradise. Wahhab ibn Munabbih, rahimahullah, one of the tabi'een, the students of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, he was once asked, 
isn't the statement la ilaha illallah the key to paradise he answered yes of course it's a key to paradise but every key has conditions or ridges that you have to bring for the door to be opened likewise la ilaha illallah has conditions if those conditions are not present then the door to jannah is not going to be open so la ilaha illallah it has far reaching meanings and far reaching implications from these implications and conditions of la ilaha illallah that there's none to be worshipped in truth except Allah is that you have knowledge of what you are saying fa'lam annahu la ilaha illallah Allah says in the Quran know that there is none to be worshipped in truth except Allah so a person has to learn about Allah and what are the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from its implications is that you have to have yaqeen you have to have certainty you have to have absolutely no doubt okay that's people for example today sadly there are some who are Muslim but they have doubt they're always going back and forth one day they're thinking oh I'm not sure if this religion is for me because there's so much atheistic pressure upon them in the society they live or other types of pressure and then the next day they say okay I'm going to be a Muslim no la ilaha illallah requires for you to be certain of what you are upon and from it also is that you have to love la ilaha illallah more than you love anything else you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the religion of Islam and submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than anything else. So this phrase, la ilaha illallah, these are some of the meanings pertaining to that. La ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lahu. Wahdahu la sharika lahu means ta'kid lil wahdaniyya. That you are affirming that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alone and he has absolutely no partner. Wahdahu being alone, uniquely alone, La sharika lahu, having no partner whatsoever. So he subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that is the khaliq. He is the only creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the unique creator. There's none other creator besides him. He is the raziq. He is the only one that provides. He is al-mudabbir. He is the only one that controls the affairs of the universe. Okay? And other such matters. So he is the only one that is to be uh, considered or to be singled out in Tawheed. So sadly there's many in the world that ascribe to Islam yet they haven't fulfilled the fundamental statement of La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu. Why? Because they give some of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to other than Allah as well. They think that there are other than Allah that know the unseen. They think they are other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that can bring good or protect people from harm. They think they are other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if they call upon them, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they call upon other than Allah azza wa jal, then their du'as will be answered. All of this is a negation of tawheed. It weakens tawheed or depending upon the act which is being done, it can actually destroy the tawheed. So all of this has to be avoided and worship and submission should be only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not associating any partners with Allah azza wa jal in any shape or form. La ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika la, lahul mulk. The next word is lahul mulk, that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs everything which is in the creation. Whether it's the creation al-ulwi, which is in the heavens and above, or al-sufli, which is below. Okay, so any type of creation in the heavens or in the earth belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa yamliku kulla shay. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls all of that and owns all of that. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, Kulillahumma malik al mulk. Proclaim, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that Allah azza wa jal is the owner of everything that exists. Allah is the owner of everything that exists. Tutil mulka man tasha. O Allah, you give from this dominion that you own, from this creation to, that you own, to whomsoever you wish. وَتَنْزِئُ الْمُلْكَ مِمَّنْ تَشَاءُ And you take this dominion from whomsoever you wish. وَتُعِزُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ And you give honour and raise high whomsoever you wish. وَتُذِلُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ And you humiliate and bring down in status whomsoever you wish. بِيَدِكَ الْخَيْرِ إِنَّكَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ In your hands is all good and you are, for, you are over all things able. So Lahul Mulk has these meanings that everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is in full and absolute control of it. And that brings contentment to the worshipper because he or she realizes that Alhamdulillah, everything in this world belongs to Allah Azza wa Jal. So I don't have to fear from the creation. If the creation are being unjust to me, if the creation are not giving me my rights, then that's no problem because it belongs to Allah in reality and he's the one who's going to give me my rights. He's the one who's going to take care of me. 
Because it, if it was not the case that it belonged to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we would be in a state of turmoil and panic and not being able to have stability in our lives. Because there's none that is more just and loving than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to know that it's in the hands of Allah azza wa jal, complete control belongs to Him alone, gives us a state of tranquility and contentment. The other word that we say in the dua after that is walahul hamd, is that we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fil ula wal akhira. We praise Allah Azawajal in all situations, in the beginning and in the end. Li'annahul hamid fi datihi wa asma'ihi. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praised in his being, meaning he's perfect in everything about him. Wa asma'ihi. His names are perfect and beautiful. Wa sifatihi. And his attributes. Wa af'alihi. And his actions. So we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we say alhamdulillah, because he is perfect, not just because he gives us. Many people, they have this narrow understanding of what does it mean to say alhamdulillah. So they think alhamdulillah is when they receive a bounty from Allah, you say alhamdulillah. No, if it was the case, it's never going to be the case. But if it was the case that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withheld from us and didn't give us anything, we would still have to say alhamdulillah. Why? Because Allah is perfect in everything about him. That's why he deserves to be praised. And he deserves to be praised even more because he gives us continually. وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ The next phrase, and he is uh, with all things able. وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ أي يَفْعَلُ مَا يُرِيدُ مِنْ غَيْرِ مُمَانِعٍ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does what he wants to do and there is nobody or anything that can prevent him from doing what he wants to do. وَلَا مُعَارُدٍ And there is no opposition to him. Qala ibn Jarir, one of the scholars of Tafsir, Ibn Jarir, he said, وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ ذُو قُدْرَةٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has complete ability to do whatever he wants to do. لَا يَتَعَذَّرْ عَلَيْهِ شَيْءٍ أَرَادَهُ he, nothing, is, nothing is prevented from him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he wants. مِنْ إِحْيَاءٍ وَإِمَاتَةٍ From giving life or giving death. وَإِعْزَازٍ وَإِذْلَالٍ From raising people in honor or humiliating people and bringing them low. وَغَيْرِ ذَلِكْ مِنَ الْأَمُورِ And other than that from situations. So nothing is possible, nothing is impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever Allah wants, He just says, كُنْ فَيَكُنْ And it is. Be and it is. And that is what needs to happen and things take place. So we should always remember that anything we want in our lives, we turn to Allah جل, Because He's هُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ He's able to do anything He wants. He's in control of everything that is in existence. There is nothing that can be prevented from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anything that we want from goodness or protection, anything that we want, guidance, we have to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should know that it's not going to benefit us turning to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine if you were in a situation where in the land that you lived, the prime minister or the king of that land, you had a direct line, a direct contact to that person. How safe and tranquil and content, content would you feel knowing that whenever you had a problem, you just pick up the phone, make a phone call, and your problem is going to be resolved. Likewise with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. Allah is with all things able and in full control. We know that all we have to do is raise our hands and make dua. Or all we have to do is get on the floor and make sujood and worship Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of, of our affairs. The next word in this beautiful narration is to say subhanallah. Saying subhanallah is tanzihullah min kulli naqs wa aib is to, you are stating when you say subhanallah that oh Allah, I am removing from you and disassociating you from any possible deficiency in your being. You are acknowledging that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolutely impossible for Allah to have any deficiency in him whatsoever. That's what the meaning subhanallah means. So he is sahib al-kamal al-mutlaq. He is the one who has complete perfection. الَّذِي لَا نَقْصْ فِيهِ بِوَجْهٍ مِنَ الْوَجْهُونَ That there is no, there's no shortcoming in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way, shape or form. And then the next word, Alhamdulillah, as we've taken before, praise be to Allah. أَلَا نَعْمِهِ أَلَّتِي لَا تُعُدْ Due to the bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us continually. Many a time we live our lives always looking and thinking about the things that we don't have. You know, psychologists at times, uh, when they're trying to deal with depression, they show two pictures to the person that's depressed. One picture is of a child that has a whole cake with one slice missing and the child is very upset. 
And another picture is of a child just with one slice, but he's so happy because he's concentrating on what he has rather than the other child concentrating on what he's missing. So we shouldn't be like that in life. That more than often we think about the things that we don't have rather than thinking about the yani, unmeasurable, in, uncountable amount of favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Can't we breathe without having a machine attached to us? Don't we breathe easily without having problems in our lungs? How many millions of people in the world have problems even breathing? Don't we see? Don't we listen? Don't we hear? Don't we taste? Don't we sleep? Don't we walk? Don't we move? Aren't we able to speak without any problems? Think without any problems? There are thousands and thousands of bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. So when we say Alhamdulillah, we should have deep appreciation of these bounties that Allah has given us because more than often we only realize a bounty when it's taken from us. So we say Alhamdulillah. The next word, Allahu Akbar, meaning Allahu Akbar mimma siwahu, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than anything else besides Allah Azza wa Anything other than Allah Azza wa in creation can never come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in magnitude. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than everything else. So if a person, if a Muslim truly lives with that belief that Allah is the greatest, He is the greatest, He's in full control of the universe, nothing can take place without His permission, then why would the person ever have despair in life? Why would the person ever not be confident in life? Why would the person ever feel weak in life? But the problem is that we don't worship Allah جل, with the understanding of Allahu Akbar, that Allah is the greatest. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ is the next statement. So I'm going to read now from Imam Ibn Rajab in his explanation of Jami' al wal Hikam uh, when explaining this statement. He says, uh, لَا تَحُولِ الْعَبْدُ مِنْ حَالْ إِلَّا حَالْ When you say لَا حَوْلَ لَا حَوْلَ It means that there is no movement. That the slave doesn't have the ability to move from one position or from one state of being negative to a state of being positive. From a state of being poor to a state of being rich. From a state of being weak to a state of being strong. The slave cannot move except with the permission of Allah That's what it means وَلَا حَوْلَ That you don't have the ability to change your state. So, and there is no strength for the person to change his state or to move except with the strength and power and might of Allah. So, when you say, you are saying that there is no ability to change a state or to move from one state to another, there is no movement except with the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَهَذِهِ كَلِمَةٌ عَظِيمًا And this is an amazing, powerful statement that Imam Ibn Rajab, he says, وَهِيَ كَنْزٌ مِنْ كُنُوزِ الْجَنَّةِ And it is a treasure from the treasures of Jannah, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in one hadith, فَالْعَبْدُ مُحْتَاجٌ إِلَى الْإِسْتِعَانَةِ بِاللَّهِ So the slave is always in need of relying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فِي فِعْلِ الْمَعْمُورَاتِ In order to do that which he has been commanded to do. Meaning that when you are told to worship Allah, read Quran, give sadaqah, when you are told to pray five times a day, any acts of worship, if you are thinking that you can do them alone without the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you are lost. It's only with the help of Allah azza wa jal that you can fulfill these virtuous deeds. So when you have this understanding of la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, then Allah helps you to do the good deeds that you need to do to benefit yourself in life. And also you need Allah's power and His help with regards to leaving off that which is haram. وَصَبَرْ عَلَى الْمَقْدُورَاتِ كُلَّهَا فِي الدُّنْيَا And to have patience upon the trials and tribulations that you are affected with in this life, that can only happen when you remember لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ That there is no change in state or movement except with the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِنْدَ الْمَوْتِ وَبَعْدَهُ مِنَ الْأَحْوَالِ الْبَرْزَقِ وَيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ And also when it comes to the time of death, and it comes to, comes to being in your grave, and it comes to being resurrected on the Day of Judgment. So none, we should truly understand that nobody can help us in the affairs that I've just mentioned except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we shouldn't be from the foolish people who call upon other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help in the dunya and help in the hereafter. فَمَنْ حَقَّقَ الْإِسْتِعَانَ عَلَيْهِ فِي ذَلِكَ كُلَّهُ أَعَانَهُ So with the one who, who actualizes in the proper manner, relying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of the affairs that have been mentioned, in the worldly affairs, in the affairs of worshipping Allah then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would help him. 
And truly, these words are truly amazing. Like, if you truly understand that nothing in this universe can move or happen without the permission of Allah Azawajal, then you'd be crazy not to submit to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and not to beg Allah Azawajal for His help. And you would be crazy also at the same time to be depressed. Why are you sad? Don't you know that you worship a Lord that is in full control of everything? And this Lord, He loves to give you and He will give you. So call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, have tawakkil, have trust upon Allah azawajal, and, and seek the means of nearness to Allah azawajal, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help us. So la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al-ali. So the word al-ali, it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alin ala jami'i khalqihi, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is high above all of his creation. Ba'inun minhum, separate from the creation. Raqibun alayhim, and he is forever watching them and knows everything that is going on. فَلَهُ الْعَلُوْ that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from this word Al-Ali which means high and raised. So Allah has Alu al-Dhat. Alu al-Dhat means that his being is high and mighty. وَعَلُوْ sifat And his attributes are high and mighty and lofty. وَعَلُوْ al-Qadr And his status is high and mighty. قال Imam al-Baghwi Imam al-Baghwi The Mufassar he said Al-Ali al-Rafi'u fawqa khalqihi Is the one that is high above his creation. So, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي and the next word العظيم العظيم is the one that is described with all descriptions of might and perfection. Okay, معاني الجلال والكمال والعظمة عظمة greatness. Imam al Baghawi he said this word العظيم it means الكبير الذي لا شيء أعظم منه it means the one that is great and there is nothing that is greater or mightier than him سبحانه وتعالى. So after mentioning these words in this narration which we are talking about when the person gets up from the night, then the person he says, Rabbi ghfilli, O oh my Lord, forgive me, forgive me. Meaning that, O oh my Lord, forgive my sins and cover my sins in a state uh, to the extent that you won't take me to account for them on the day of judgment. Okay? And this is from the greatest of blessings, that if Allah truly forgives a person to the extent that they won't even be asked about that sin on the day of judgment, then the person is in true happiness. And that's how we want to be. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So the person says, Rabbi ghfilli. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is something we need to comprehend and we need to reflect upon it. Because Allah, if He wishes to do so, He has the right to do what He wants with His creation. Like He did with Adam Islam, for just one sin, one disobedience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed Adam and, and our mother Hawa from Jannah. Adam and Eve, they were removed from Jannah just for one sin. How many times do we commit a sin? How many times do we commit sins against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So in the hadith in Sahih Muslim for us to understand a bit more about the mercy of Allah Azawajal, it says, لِلَّهُ أَشَدُّ فَرْحًا بِتَوْبَةِ عَبْدِهِ هِنَا يَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more happy and pleased with the repentance of his servant when his servant repents to him. Like one of you who is upon a riding beast in an open land like a desert. So this person is upon his riding beast and the person takes a break under a tree right, from his long journey. He ties up his riding beast, but then he gets up and he finds that his riding beast has now left him. And upon his riding beast was his water, his drink, and everything that he owned. So all of his life now has just left him in an instant. And he realizes that, that he's going to die without that riding beast, without that food and that wa- without that water. So in total despair, he goes back to sleep. And then again, he wakes up all of a sudden and he finds the riding beast has returned to him. So he's so happy and so excited that he says, out of this excitement, Allahumma anta abdi wa anna rabbuka. Oh Allah, you are my slave and I am your Lord. So he makes the mistake because he's so excited. Instead of saying, Oh Allah, I am your slave and you are my Lord, he says instead, Oh Allah, you are my slave and I am your Lord. Akhta min shiddatil farh. So he made a mistake because he was so happy and so overwhelmed with joy. The hadith is telling us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more joyful, more happy with the return of his slave, with repentance to Allah, than this person in this situation where he lost everything and then again, again it returned to him all of a sudden. So we should bring this to mind and it will make us truly want to love and appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That with all our deficiencies and all the mistakes that we make continually, moment after moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we are true, and we are truthful in returning to Allah جل, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so happy to forgive us. Ta'ara min al-layl, the, the hadith it says, Ta'ara min al-layl, that the person when he moves in the night and he gets up, okay, and makes dua. 
then the person's uh, dua is going to be accepted. And also, if the person gets up, they make wudu, and they pray, then their prayers are going to be accepted. Just a few more benefits from the, benefits from the hadith. It shows us, al-isharatu ila ahmiyat al-tawheed alladhi huwa da'atu jameer rusul. It reminds of this hadith when we started with la ilaha illallah. It reminds us, reminds us of the importance of tawheed, singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone for worship and other matters. And it reminds us, al-irshad ila isti'anati billahi wahdahu wa tafweed al-amr ilayhi. It reminds us that when we say that we know that everything is in complete control with Allah is in complete control of everything. So we should give up our affairs to Allah. Yes, we have to strive and we try our best, but our hearts know that we are relying upon Allah for the outcome. So we relegate our affairs to Allah knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will bring about the outcome. الحث على الاجتهاد في طاعة في الطاعة والإسراء المسير إلى الله، and to know that we should race in doing good deeds because this hadith is encouraging us that when you say these words and you get up in the night that it's better for you that you get up you make wudu and you pray two rak'ah or you make a du'a. Okay, so the hadith is reminding us that as soon as you get up the first thing that should connect to your mind and your soul is to remember Allah Azza wa Jal, not to look at your phone and the WhatsApp messages, rather remember Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal, and if you can do so, make wudu and pray. Uh, Ibn Battal, Imam Ibn Battal, uh, one of the great scholars, the explainers of Sahih Bukhari, he said in this hadith, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ عَلَى لِسَانِ نَبِيهِ أَنَّ مَنْ اسْتَيْقَذَ مِنْ نَوْمِهِ لَحْجًا لِسَانَهُ بِتَوْهِيدِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed the one who gets up from his sleep whilst their tongue is attached to these words of remembrance, meaning attached to the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making tasbih to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying subhanallah wa taslim lahu bil ajz an il qudrati illa bi'awnihi and recognizing that me as a slave I have no ability except with the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala annahu idha da'ahu ajabahu when the person wakes up with this state of mind and soul and makes dua then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to answer him or her وَإِنْ صَلَّى قُبِلَتْ صَلَاتُهُ And when the person makes a salah, then the person's salah is going to be accepted. فَيَنْبَغِ لِمَنْ بَلَغُهُ فَيَنْبَغِ لِمَنْ بَلَغَهُ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَنْ يَغْتَنِمْ الْعَمَلْ بِهِ وَيُخْلِسْ أَنِّيَ لَهُ لِرَبِّهِ سُبْحَانَ وَتَعَالَى So it's imperative that the one who hears of this hadith, reading it, listening to it, or understanding it, that the person takes benefit of this hadith and uses it to the best of their ability while having a good intention and sincere intention for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this hadith, hadith brings about you, brings to you immense rewards and benefits. When you say it, your sins are forgiven. When you say it, your du'as are going to be accepted. When you say it, your salah that you make in the night is going to be accepted. What else can we want as worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And also a last benefit from this hadith, uh, the Shaykh, he says in explaining, لو تسوك بعد قول حد الذكر كان أفضل لقول ابن عمر رضي الله عنه. If the person, male or female, when they get up and they say this dhikr, if they use the miswak after having done so, then this is something which is very good because the Prophet وسلم, as mentioned in the hadith collected by Imam Tabarani in his Mu'jim al-Kabir, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يتعارى من الليل إلا أجر سواك على فيه that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would not get up in the night except that he would use the, uh, the miswak uh, in his mouth. And also the hadith of Hadaifah we have كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا قام من الليل يشو صفاه بالسواك that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم when he would get up from the night he would use the miswak, rub the miswak in his mouth. And there's another, other narrations which show the importance of doing so. They say, why? Because the mouth, when you recite the words of Allah Azawajal, and you recite the Quran in the night when you have that special worship with Allah Azawajal, then there are angels that come to you. The angels, they come close to you as you're reciting the Quran, and they take that Quran from you, that recitation, and they transcend the heavens with that recitation as a way of honoring you and honoring what you are doing. So by virtue of the fact that the angels are coming close to you, it's nice to have your mouth clean by making in the miswak and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me for the mistakes that I have made in explaining these words. And all perfection is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anything which was correct was as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mistakes were from myself and shaitan.